I know. Sorry. Use your new title. All right. Once again, we want to welcome Kevin Griebenau to our Nature Speaks lecture tonight on hydrology. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yes, my name is Kevin Griebenau. I'm the regional engineer at the uh, Division of Dam Safety and Inspections with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And uh, I, I've been in, involved with hydrology and water for uh, quite a long time. I did not graduate. Uh, I actually graduated with a degree in structures with civil engineering. But ever since I've left school, I've been involved uh, with water. So to me, I always uh, like that. To, to me, hydrology, it's such a broad, you can see by this definition, it's a very, very broad topic. But uh, I, to me, I've come up with my own uh, definition of surface hydrology. Is, and, and, I remind people of it frequently is that water flows downhill and if it's clean towards money, assuming they don't have too much of it, i.e. it's flooding. And then just to swing this, you, sometimes you might hear H and H and that's hydrology and hydraulics. And hydrology is how much water and hydraulics is how high or how is it uh, gonna flow. Now, like I said, I originally graduated with a degree in structures but it really kind of my, my world really changed 40 years ago when I ended up as being a Peace Corps volunteer in Yemen. And there, that's where I built a water supply projects um, in villages there. And so these are two examples of uh, all this uh, water towers. And we placed all that concrete by hand, by bucket. Uh, and this was in 1983. And I just remember we went uh, over our water bill and I think it was, uh, we used 166 gallons a day, three of us in the household. And uh, when I was there in Yemen, I think I used about five gallons a day because, uh, you know, when you have to carry it, um, water uh, weighs about eight and a half pounds a gallon. And if you have to carry it, uh, that's about 40 pounds uh, for a five gallon bucket. So you really don't use a lot. So then after the Peace Corps, I joined the Army Corps of Engineers. And um, where there I started, as I said, H&H &H Hydrology and Hydraulics. And from there, I went to FEMA, the National Flood Insurance Program. And from there, I where I've been at uh, the FDRC or the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, where I uh, look at the safety of dams. Did I? Um, so to me, like I said, hydrology is a very broad topic. And this just shows you, uh, you know, just you, you can pick any aspect of this um, and, and really kind of develop or delve into it and peel it back. And mostly tonight, I think we'll look at precipitation, stream flow, snow, infiltration, surface runoff, and urbanization. But like I say, it, you know, you can get into groundwater, you can get into contaminated groundwater, and then uh, like salt intrusion. So hydrology can really uh, open up a lot of uh, a lot of different areas. And just some basic units. Um, some of the, you know, if it, we were metric, which was you know kind of what we used in Yemen, but here we use these funky things called acres. And uh, there's 43,560 square feet in an acre. To me, it's always a good test. If someone says they're a hydrologist, ask them what the, the number four, 43,560 means. And if they know the answer to that, then they're, they're okay. And a, uh, does there, a football field is 1.3 acres. Um, any, I don't know, to me, that's always a good thing to have in the back of our minds. But a big thing, especially in the irrigation world, is an acre foot. And just like it sounds, that means you have a foot of water spread evenly over an acre. And that is 43,560 cubic feet of water or 326,000 gallons. Now, the big thing is, you know, why do I have a basketball up there? Because now we measure water as it's flowing by you by the cubic feet per second. And that's about equivalent, a cubic foot is about equivalent to a basketball. So like when you hear a term, like there's a thousand CFS or a thousand cubic feet per second going by in the Des Plaines River, that means every second there's a thousand basketballs going by of water. And I think when I was up here earlier this spring, I think the Des Plaines was about the 3000 CFS. 
Uh, I've been involved with the Ohio River and that varied between 50,000 CFS and I think it was close to a million cubic feet per second. So it, on the Ohio River and sometime the Mississippi, every second there's a million basketballs going by. It's just sometimes hard to believe that the, you know, that just the, the volume of water that's going by in some of these rivers. And here's another big one that we always get into like the hundred year flood. And you can read it there. And usually we say the hundred year flood. I don't know, it just sounds, I don't know, better to understand. But the flip of it, if you take the reciprocal of that, it's also the 1% annual exceedance probability. In other words, as I um, uh, as I've have there down at the bottom, if every year the flood god or goddess, she has a hundred side, a hundred side die and she rolls it. And if it comes up 100, that means you're going to get the 100 year flood. It could come up 50. That means you would get the two year flood. If it came up one, she would get the one year flood. And every year, this god or goddess throws the dice. So every year, you do have the chance of a 100 year flood. And it is a 1% chance of that coming up. So I'm just trying to. Uh, you know, you, they are, they're saying the same things, but sometimes we get this, well, we had a hundred year flood last year. So there's no way we're gonna get a hundred year flood this year. And that's not really the case. And, you know, like, as I said, you can have a 200 year floods back to back, just like you can throw two sixes and you pick it up again. And next time it's an independent event and you could throw two sixes again. It's, it's uh, unlikely, but they're independent events. So to me, let's get into a little precipitation. And, and when you start looking at these numbers, um, like uh, for a uh, one hour, uh, I did not try this. Oh, oh no, that was scary. Um, so we look at one hour, if we go up for one hour, um, the world record is 20 inches of rain. In one hour, we have 20 inches of rain. And even if you get down to five minutes, that's a log scale, three inches of rain in five minutes is the world record. And the US record isn't too far behind that. And then you get out to here, like in a uh, three day event, um, that looks like 70 inches of rain. So you can just see like sometimes we, you know, we complain or that, uh, um, you know, we get a lot of rain, but. It's just amazing just what is the possibility and there's even a debate, is there an upper limit about as how much moisture the atmosphere can carry. And when you start talking about the, the atmosphere warming for every degree Fahrenheit it increases, it can carry about four to 5% more moisture. So that's a very as we get warmer, a little you know so two degrees is almost like 10% more moisture and more moisture means the potential of more rain. So let's look at a couple of storms. I don't know how many of you remember Hurricane Harvey. There were some great pictures uh, of just that area inundated right there around Houston. And so I think this was about a four day event. And the, so yeah, almost 50 inches of rain. So that's, you know, in four days. And what's amazing is that that's in this dark blue area, but it's all around. So that if it 50 inches, moves from here to over there, that basically means you have 100 inches now. So it just is, becomes a huge volume. Um, uh, you know, where is the water going to go when you get this much rain? And it was the highest rainfall amount in a single storm for any place in the continental United States. And, and so if we go on, I've worked with this uh, company. It's called Metstat. It's amazing how many um, um, weather services now are coming up to help um, you know, airlines, uh, crop insurances, um, but Metstat analyzed this and they said it was between a 250 year or 5,000 year event. And it's just, you know, how do, you, how do you look at the duration? That's one thing I'd say my frustration is, is that there's never a duration like it was a 100 year storm for a one day event, because you can have, we'll see, we'll see an example of what I'm talking about here. And then I don't know, I remember this, uh, this one is really interesting because I think the QPF, I know those beginning slides, a quantitative precipitation forecast was just like a couple of inches. And talking to weather forecasters, they can, you know, they can see how much moisture is in the air, 
But what they have difficulty is when it starts training, where it just kind of just keeps kind of going back on top of itself. So you can see here um, in a, and I think it was like, yeah, in six hours, they got eight inches of rain, just short of eight inches of rain. And this was like a thousand year storm. And it just was in a very narrow patch uh, of just there kind of to the Northwest of, of St. Louis. And I think this set all sorts of records, you know, that you, we have records. And to me, just like when the temperature record beats it by one degree or two, okay, you know, that just kind of nudges it up a little, but this just kind of increases about like 25 to 50% from the old, from the old record. To me, that tells me there's there's something going on. And uh, to me, a little closer to home, this was a very interesting one, uh, Aurora College in 1996. I don't know if you remember where you were. Um, 18 inches in two days. Uh, and, and again, to me, I don't know if we'll, we'll uh, could, could this storm happen here? And that's what we start doing with as a hydrometeorology is you start moving these storms around and you, so you maximize them it's called, and then you move them around and you make decisions on what are the implications of moving this storm? Um, do, you, do you make it smaller because you're moving it away from the moisture source or do you make it larger because you're moving it closer to the moisture source? Uh, so like I say, it just was a very, again, the, the storm is aligning to the Northwest to the Southeast. But this storm was a major, I would say, a major one used that we do for um, um, designing dams and nuclear power plants. We'll talk about a little bit about that. And again, I don't know if anybody has ever, you know, have you ever been in a rainstorm that the, the intensity of the rain was like an inch an hour? I mean, if with an inch an hour, it's kind of gray out when you look outside. And if you look at this graph, there kind of uh, that one black bar that sticks way up the intensity of the rain was five inches an hour. Uh, it, it, you know, I don't know if, you know, if you would go out and stand in that, I don't know if it would be like pounding in the ground with your umbrella, just the impact. I mean, that, that's an incredible intensity. And then second place is three inches. Right after that cloud burst, it was three inches an hour. And so that blue line then is, is showing the, the accumulated amount. Um, but the, to me, it's just uh, then, how mother nature uh, just kind of really piles up and then it takes a break and then it kind of goes back. Like I say, at one inch an hour is, is a pretty intense rainstorm. I mean, like usually um, we'll get to maybe a couple of tenths an in, uh, inch an hour. And uh, that, that's kind of what we typically get here. So, so what do you know, like that Aurora storm? So to me, this is a really handy reference. It's called NOAA Atlas 14. You can go on there and it's uh, the National Weather Service has done it for almost the entire country. And so you can go into this and it will tell you, uh, like if you have a rainstorm, I like doing this when you hear um, like that one to the, where it was in the city here a couple of months ago and there were manhole covers coming off the streets. Um, you know, well, how, how intense or what kind of storm was that? So I did it here for Prospect Heights. And so we just pull off a couple of numbers. See, like I said, you can see the duration along the bottom. And then we have the, the interval or the frequency as by the different colors. So you really need the, the, the recurrence interval and the duration. To me, it can be a hundred year rainstorm, but was it a 24 hour? Was it a 12 hour? You know, what was the duration of that storm? Because that means that will have an impact then on the volume. But usually kind of the litmus test or usually a number we grab onto is the 24 hour, 100 year storm. And for prospect heights, according to Atlas 14, it's about seven and a half inches. So that has a 1% probability of happening every year, approximately. So, but we have uh, McDonald's Creek. Um, I don't, haven't done any studies, but I assume we, we'd call that the, the time of concentration or if it rains on McDonald Creek, it's not that big that if we would get it, we would get it cooking or we would get it flowing with probably a much shorter storm so that we could, we would probably use like a two hour or a three hour storm for McDonald Creek. And we would see that that's probably about four inches for that duration. But then that other arrow kind of floating up there in the way in the middle is 18 inches over uh, 24 hours. And it is just well above 1000 years. So, so what does that mean? Is that is that Noah's flood or what what does that mean? 
So what what uh, in in when we were starting to design um, dams in the fifties and nuclear power plants, the uh, these people said we need we need a design criteria for these these civil structures, and we need something that's big. And so the National Weather Service came up with a probable maximum precipitation, or it's called the PMP. And these were calculated then in the hydrometeorological reports. And so the weather service then took those storms, just like some of the storms I was talking about, and they have like this big black Bible of all these storms, and you move them around, and then you come up with like this, this graph here, or this uh, map with the contours of, of the 24-hour, 10-square-mile all-season PMP. So it's a warm season. So again, if we look, um, I'm going to walk over here. So we're here in Illinois. So here's 30, um, 32, so we're right here. So we're about 31 inches in what did I say, 24 hours. Can you imagine what McDonald Creek would be like if we got 30 inches of rain in 24 hours? It, it would not be pretty. I, I think we can all agree to that. But you can also see, what also can you tell from this map? What you can tell from this map was where, where's all our moisture coming from? It's coming from the Gulf of Mexico. That's where, you know, with all those, it comes up and then the, the uh, jet stream then carries it off to the east. And then those stippled areas and then out, like out in the east is, is um, it's called stippled. I don't know where that, is that a word? I, but they, the weather service came up with it. But that means you're in the Appalachians or mountains and that with orographics, that means you, you need to sharpen your pencil and you really shouldn't use these values. So I said, you know, like I said, these were used for uh, designing dams and uh, nuclear uh, reactors and stuff that you really want to make sure they can weather the storm. So let's go back to Hurricane Harvey. So you can see the, uh, the dash lines are Hurricane Harvey and then the solid lines are PMP values. So you can see like for the 72 hour PMP um, for 10 square miles, it's like 55 inches. Um, is there, so, um, where, so there were some people that were nervous about Hurricane Harvey and they were nervous. I'm trying to find it now, Harvey, because in some, in some areas, I think it was for a longer duration, Hurricane Harvey was basically equal to, or maybe exceeded the PMP or the probable maximum precip. So does that mean our method is flawed or we're making poor assumptions? Or is, our, is the atmosphere changing? Is it warming up? Has it warmed up two degrees? And so we can carry more moisture. So actually the weather service in these infrastructure bills, the weather service is getting going back into these, into Atlas 14 and into these HMRs and gonna be updating those to, uh, it's called non-stationarity because of the change that's going on of, of, uh, with the atmosphere. Um, here I found this, this was a very interesting thing with respect to uh, uh, flooding. Um, this was an in, uh, flood inundation maps for the Des Plaines River and it's north of here, but there was a series of, what they did was they took just a series of flows and they moved them down hydraulically through the Des Plaines River. So you really don't even worry about, is this a hundred year, 50 year flood? But then if, if you see what's coming down, the emergency management people can say, okay, this is, this is the map we should be using or we need this map. So I thought it was a very interesting uh, study done by the USGS for emergency managers of, of uh, where do we think we are um, in the way of, of deploying resources or what areas do we think are gonna flood? Like I say, so this would be hydrology and hydraulics from, from the 50 year to the uh, 500 year flood they did that for just north of here. Now this was, I think, because some of us were looking at um, that picture on the back wall. And um, this is from the, your Natural Resources Commission it has a very interesting report. It's the assessment and management recommendations for the Slough and Hillcrest Lake. And, and just looking at this, to me, it's very interesting that that dash dot dot dash line is the drainage basin. So, so if a drop falls here, just like on the Rockies, if a drop falls right half will go this way and half will not go into this way. So it's just, it's amazing to go up there and look at a river quite steep here. 
Um, so it'd be interesting to take this map and walk out there and can you find those divides and where that basin is and, and where the water is going. So that's what's being shown by those divides. I don't know what the three and four are, but then we back out a little more. And so we have here the drainage basin for McDonald Creek. And then that little that little balloon there is, is the monitoring location of the US US gauge. And like I said, uh, McDonald Creek is just under 10 square miles and 7.93 square miles. Um, and it was interesting. I was at the gauge, you'll see here, and in driving, what, what was that? Um, right here, close to the train station, Palm East West. That was that, that one. So going, and right away, you can see, here's the divide. You can see, you go right, right, right and it, it breaks right there. I, and I, I'm just noticing that. So I went and visited the USGS gauge. I don't know if anybody have you ever noticed uh, this, this little green shack there. That's what that is. This is the, the river gauge for, for McDonald Creek. Um, and so here, here are all the um, maximum annual floods. And uh, guess when the maximum was? When was the biggest flood you guys have had here? 1987. You see it up there at the top, kind of right in the middle there. That was when I think O'Hare was on the front page and people were carrying their suitcases coming out of O'Hare. So even here, because to me it's amazing, rain can vary to large distances. Large distances. So the maximum, the flood of record for that gauge was in 1987, and it was uh, 800 CFS. So in that little creek, there were 800 basketballs going by every second during that flood of 1987. Um, but it was kind of interesting. Look at some of the statistics. It said I, I, the average velocity was only three, three feet per second. Um, and there's 780 and 25 feet uh, width and a square area of 251 square feet. So we'll look at that. So, so now I, I use a program and you rank all those flows. And so you come up with what is called the flood frequency curve. So here you can see I, on the 100-year the, the flood, or the, as we call it, the 100-year, 50-year, those numbers are on the top. And the fractions or percentages are on the bottom. So according to that gauge, that 1987 flood, you can see that point there way on the upper right, um, was just short of being the 100-year flood. And it looks like the 100-year flood is like 850 CFS. Do people see where the red line coming down from 100? Um, that's what I would guess. But then we have these green lines. Like, because we're not sure, we only have a short period of time and we're saying like we can predict what the 100 year flood is. So ideally you would like to have, you know, a long period, the longer period of record, just like you throw in the die, the longer you throw it, the more you can get your, your statistical distribution. And the 500 year flood is about a thousand CFS. But also if you go down to kind of right in the middle of this, this curve or line, it's a, the two-year flood is about 200 CFS, and that's typically called a bank fault flood. Now, why am I going back down to a two-year flood? Has anybody ever cared about a two-year flood? Well, let's look at it. So here, here I am on, on this beautiful January 2nd. Um, my wife's probably wondering why I'm taking so long. I think I was just going to Costco, but I found this place. And so I'm taking picture of this. And um, so I'm standing on, I'm saying that grass area is the floodplain. And then probably just maybe on the terrace uh, of uh, the creek. And so, yeah, like I say, and, and on the opposite banks, I'm seeing uh, there, you can see where there's trees above a certain line. So I would say bank full is below the trees there and would inundate those, the grass area. And the bank full or the two-year flood is really where rivers do most of their work, moving sediment and moving things around. And so here, this is kind of, I'm getting closer to the bridge. That's about, I'm guessing, um, like a, a two-year flood would rise to that level. But it's interesting, I just, it, the, the invert or the bottom of the creek is armored with these concrete blocks. I don't know who or why, or I guess maybe to protect the bridge. I, I thought that was, um, I don't know what the purpose of those were. But then it was also interesting, so I turned and looked under the bridge, and, and that to me is even a better example of what, of what the river can do or what the river is capable of doing, that that is its normal channel, if you will, 
of, of what the two-year flood can do basically between those two banks there. And then those sides or those haunches are, are the floodplain. So anybody a, a Coco Raz volunteer? This is another great site. Um, Coco Raz is Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Volunteer Network. So these are all volunteers that have people that have a rain gauge, a really nice rain gauge in their backyard. Um, and they every morning they're supposed to report how much rain they get uh, at seven uh, at seven in the morning, and also snow. So at some place I like to visit. When you hear of something going on, you can see just the disparity or just how quickly rain changes. Um, so just on this day and uh, just after Christmas, I grabbed this. You know, in California there there were some rain gauges that got eight inches there on the California coast uh, in in uh, 24 hours. But we had kind of a, a light rain with a trace to maybe a couple of tents or something. And uh, here's the Coco Raz uh, um, rain gauge or precip gauge. It's a really neat gauge in that it can store up to 11 inches of rain. So if you have 11 inches in 24 hours, this rain gauge could still uh, could still uh, capture that for you. And you can see the water in there. It looks like it's about uh, 0.22 inches of rain that was captured by this rain gauge. So also then, um, I don't know, how do you remember the flood of eight, uh, May 18th, 2020? I don't know if you remember any fun uh, Twitter pictures where the Sears Tower went dark. We were at another event um, where, what's his name? Will, um, um, at your at your library, Betts. Hey, no, uh, uh, the guy we just saw, Dilla. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's this, uh, he's a, a historian, um, but he's also a ComEd employee, and he said he was involved with wiring, getting the Sears Tower back, uh, back lit up because it was inundated, and he was working sixteen hours on and eight hours off for eight days. And he said he's never made so much money, but he said it was really neat. So, so what's interesting now, so we get this, so this rain, um, you can see kind of along the South Branch and even further down into the uh, another river basin, but kind of right on the South Branch, it rained about three, four, six inches. And so kind of in with that South Branch, you know, we reversed the flow of the river, but when it rains like this and it's flat, the water is probably flowing both ways. There's probably water flowing down towards the Illinois, but the water is so piled up that it's also probably trying to go the way it wanted to back out to the lake. And that's why it caused so much problems. And in downtown, it went up six feet and like I say, inundated the vault. And here's some uh, Coco Raz numbers that I grabbed. And you can see way down there at the bottom, uh, it's 4.3 inches. And like I say, what I love about this is you can just see how greatly rainfall varies over short distances. I think, you know, it's just rain, we think it just covers everywhere. But in relatively short distances, you can get very, very different numbers. And that's to me is what the, uh, the fun is uh, and the difficulty is of, of trying to deal with rain. So another thing like I mentioned is snow and, and we uh, SWE is a very important thing like uh, two days or was it just yesterday? The SWE of that snow was probably uh, about uh, 20, where, where if you me melt um, the snow, how much water is in the snow? And it's sometimes called heart attack snow or mashed potato snow. That has a very high SWE, and then the powder has a much lower SWE. Um, and, uh, so, and this is then giving you a map because now you can start getting into flood, you know, what's the spring runoff gonna be? What do we have for the potential of runoff? Uh, of how much water is sitting out there? And again, so this is numerous agencies are, are going out and they're actually doing tubes and they have snow pillows and all different kinds of um, um, instruments to try to, uh, to estimate this. And like I say, it's very beneficial into as you get into spring and then the snowpack is ripening, um, just trying to make a prediction, are, are you expecting uh, floods? So here we kind of get into the real fun of what I would say the real guts of hydrology. We have all these processes going on, you know, the rain falls on, on vegetation and that can evaporate or the, the vegetation can transpire that off. Or the rain falls through and hits the land and it can also evaporate from the land or it can infiltrate 
or it can also evaporate from the land surface. And then it can go into the soil and then ultimately it can percolate into the groundwater. But then off the land surface, you can see we have overland flow goes into the stream, we have interflow, and then we have base flow all going into the stream channel, which as I pointed out down at the very bottom there is called the watershed discharge. And that's really, I'd say, what usually we think of you know, in the stream flow or to me, hydrology. So you have to, hydrology is trying to kind of understand and put all of these things into a model. So you, you put all of that into a black box and this is what you come out with. So you have a, you have a unit of rain and you fall it on your basin and then you stand it like where that gauge was and then you watch the water come up and then you watch it go down after it's done raining. And so this is, I would say, then is the basin's response then from that event. And ideally then you would have that Ideally, you would have Mother Nature put an inch of rain evenly over your basin for an hour, and then if you'd go out there at that gauge, you could have your, your unit hydrograph. So then you could use that to then, whatever the storm is, you could come up with a hydrograph to, to model or see which and predict what the response is going to be. So I've attempted to, well, let's say we have one we have one inch of rain, and then after a period of time, it doesn't rain, and then we have another same unit. So really all hydrology then is you take that unit hydrograph and you would either you know, uh, increase it or decrease it and then you would offset it in time and then you add them up as you, and so, so the resulting hydrograph from those two bursts of rain would look something like I'm trying to draw on a kind of freehand there, but like say the, the, the computer models just do a much more elegant job of, of uh, doing that or doing those processes. But this is just then the runoff. And so, but you have to get to that point of, of how much water is running off. And that's kind of the fun. And again, back to this map, um, I could not find, I, I don't know if I, your natural resources or your, that the main soil is a Markham Ashcombe Beecher complex soil. Because I wanted to find out what, what is the, what are the characteristics of that soil? Um, what it, what is its infiltration rate? What can it, what it is its um, capacity? And I thought I, no, I, I didn't come up with any numbers there. So again, just so, like I say, just the soil part of the infiltration, this is sometimes called the uh, sacramental method, um, where you have all these like buckets that the water can fill up and run out of, or run off to the surface. And so just, just before you even deal with the runoff, you have to figure out, you have to you know, satisfy all these things. And I was involved with the, um, a, a hydrology study for the Osabo River in Michigan. If you ever have a chance to canoe the Osabo River, it's a, it means the river of sand basically, um, but it's a very heavily forested and, and it can rain a half an inch and nothing happens in the river just because it's the trees are very evergreens and the sandy soil that in a half an inch doesn't even satisfy all the stuff above the ground. So it's just amazing. Uh, and then, but on the flip side here, what do you think happens when we have impervious ground or parking lots? You can get a 10th of an inch and now you're getting a response or that's running into your river and you're getting a response. Oh, see, this is what I was trying like that soil type you can see kind of that middle column is what well, I wanted to, I'm curious what that soil type, what kind of hydraulic conductivity that soil type would be. In other words, if you would sit water on that, like that first, like sand, sand that they're talking about there at this porosity, 21 centimeters an hour of water could flow through sand. And as you get to the bottom, you can see a lot of our uh, soils in this area are clays. And, and clays are basically, to me, usually about a 10th of an inch an hour is all the water that really infiltrates or goes into the soil when it's very clay. So what's that mean? If you get anything more than a 10th of an inch of rain on clay soils, you're gonna get runoff. And then also just kind of like I was so pointing out with us standing there at the gauge, as you flow, it kind of, it, it kind of piles up in stores it can go into areas and then as it, as it goes down, then it will go back into that. 
So then it's called routing. You have to route um, the water as it's going downhill. And just think of it as your bathtub. If you turn on your water and your drain is open, if the water is filling up, if the water is coming out of your spigot faster than it's draining, what is it going to do? It's going to fill up. And if it's coming out, coming out of the spigot slower than it's draining, it's going to, the, the water in the bathtub is going to go down. That's all that the equation on the bottom there is saying. But, but you just do this for each section of the river because there is storage going on into the overbanks. Um, and it, depending upon the river, it can become a very important or critical aspect of, of uh, routing a, a uh, water down a river. And here, especially in, in the major metropolitan area that we are in, um, rural versus urban, as I've alluded to, um, the urban stream is yellow and our rural stream is green. One of the big things I would say in an urban area is we have um, impervious areas, sidewalks, parking lots, roofs, um, and there's no infiltration rate. So you, you get a tenth of an inch or just a few tenths of an inch and you're getting runoff. Where in a, in a rural area, you don't have impervious areas. You have all these different areas, whereas the water's flowing along, it just has a chance to infiltrate. So not only um, your urban hydrograph from the same amount of rain, it's going to come off much faster and there's going to be much more um, um, rain. So that causes all sorts of problems. It, 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 uh, so what are the implications? So that means whether it's faster, that means your velocity is higher. So what does a higher velocity mean? Erosion. So that's why as we, as we urbanize an area, that gets steeper and steeper and the velocities get higher and higher for the same amount of water. So our velocities are going higher um, for, the same, for the same kind of event. And we also, and I also kind of, I don't know why we, we with a lot of subdivisions these days, they compact the soil. In some subdivisions, the soil is so compacted, it is almost basically impervious because um, they, they strip all the blacktop off come in and they put the sod on top of it. So it's, it's almost like it looks green and you would think it would soak up rain, but it basically is, is uh, close to impervious. Okay, so now here, just to kind of look at some volumes. So if we look at just the, uh, the, the 1.1 square mile of the, the lake in the slough, um, that's just over, so it's just over an acre. So that's 47,000 acres. And the lake and the slough were 14 and 12 and a half acres. So I was looking at, so let's say we can surcharge or put three feet uh, on top of that, um, um, giving them a total of 78 acres. Um, oh yeah, so it's three times 25 is seven. So I, I'm saying that we can store three feet on top of the lake and the slough. Let's say if we want to do, um, store that to, for some flood reduction for the people downstream. But if we look at just one inch of runoff, it's just under 4,000 acre feet of water. So that would fill that three feet up 50 times over. So it just shows you, you would think that, you know, we have all this volume, but I think, like I said, we just don't realize just like one inch of rain just on this little area. It's just, it, it just is a lot of water. And then also, again, so you can, um, the National Weather Service then puts out these flood predictions. Um, I did not find it for McDonald. Did they only do this for some major? Um, wait a minute, I checked that. So you can see that they do do that. And when did I grab that? Um, yeah, this is again, it's just after Christmas. We had a little blip there. I'm looking at the one on the right where it just jumped up a little there. Oh, that's amazing how quickly that went up. Um, so it was just going along at one foot and then it jumped up two feet to three feet and just right at an action level. You can go in there and what action minor and moderate, I'm assuming would, it would tell you on these sites, what are the implications in of that flood stage? And these are also very interesting then, especially when you get into levied areas, like if, um, you know, a Prospect Heights or Mount Prospect, if we have a levy that's, uh, you know, uh, at the stage of six, we would be looking at this very closely to see what they're predicting. Are we going to have to sandbag it to get more? Or are we going to be okay with our existing uh, levy system? And then also, to me, it's even funner. You send a look at some of these events 
um, like with these atmospheric rivers going on and just what's uh, what, what they're looking at. Um, so here is one I grabbed. Uh, this one is uh, about a week ago. Yes, uh, but when we were hearing all those atmospheric rivers come in, and this one is just uh, just two feet short of the record, and we're in the red. So that means you know bad things are happening. Usually, that means in the red is that you're inundating residential houses and in businesses. And usually, like minor uh, is usually bankful, where the river is just kind of going out into its floodplain. And then here, um, the one on the right, oh, the one on the left, excuse me. No, this one. That one's from the Hay Report. Um, I don't know when they grabbed that, but I grabbed the most recent one. It's from the uh, the flood insurance rate map. And there's a lot of good information in there. You can see it's a zone AE and the elevation is 651 feet. And there's some different colored in there. So that is showing you the flood way with the, the stripes. And then we kind of got the light blue that's showing you the edge of the 100 year flood plain. And then, and then on this one, it also shows you the 500 year flood plain. And you could go to the, um, the flood insurance study and it would have a profile to show you of how much higher that 500 year flood is the, over the 100 year flood. And like I say, then that comes out of the culvert and then you can see that goes in. Well, what's the difference? Well, that's also, that's interesting. Now, what I'm looking at, I didn't notice this is 651 here, but that's also, so there's almost no, when we have a hundred year flood, the creek is the same elevation as your lake there. Have you experienced that or is it quite close? Um, that would be interesting to go out there with a flood. So, but this is uh, just one thing to make clear is that Yes, if you if you have a federally insured mortgage and you're in the hundred year floodplain, you have to buy flood insurance. But if you're outside of the floodplain, you don't have to buy flood insurance, but you can buy flood insurance. In fact, when I was there, it was like, and I don't think it's changed that much. Half of the claims are outside of the one hundred year um, floodplain. Another thing I guess I was doing for a while, and I think this is the way to like to teach biology. I was doing this at a site in Weller Creek in Ma Mount Prospect, is, is that uh, you do hydrology, but then you also try to get into the water quality. And to do this, you, you sample the macroinvertebrates. But also, like I say, you get in the water, you realize, you know, if the water's two feet deep and it's flowing at two feet per second, what's that feel like? Because then you can get into hazards I think it's usually the rule of seven or eight that if it's two feet deep and three feet per second, you're starting to get into a dangerous area of just, just the force of water then. So, but this river watch monitoring then is you pick a site and you, you measure the hydrology of the water and how deep and, and, and then you also sample these little tiny creatures. And then from that, you infer a water quality. And to me, when I was doing it, it was just amazing of just these almost kind of um, um, very extraterrestrial, just some very interesting creatures you find. And depending upon what you find, like I said, you infer a water quality. And I thought it was just a great way um, to, to understand the, a macro, uh, benthic macroinvertebrates. Uh, it, it, and they use these on big rivers and small rivers. Uh, just, just something I, I really, uh, I, I was amazed at. And I was, uh, like I say, very much enjoyed. Another thing, kind of like what I say, what uh, the creek was doing there under the bridge of when you try to do stream restoration, we, we have greatly altered. Like I, I gave a speech uh, last night, actually, or yesterday on the Chicago River. And, you know, what we've done to the Chicago River, um, I don't know if we could ever put it back the way it was. But let's say if there was a, 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 a valiant attempt to try to restore McDonald Creek, you would have to study, you know, what is the slope? What is it's flowing through? And, and trying to get an understanding of what the, the river is trying to do um, as it's flowing downhill and going over the land. And so this is a very interesting system, I think, to help uh, people do stream restoration. And the guy that came up with it was uh, Dave Roskin, a very interesting guy. And I had the, uh, I actually had uh, I got to take this course out in Pagosa Springs, Colorado, and it was uh, a, a great time and one of the one of my all-time favorites uh, 
it's just a fascinating uh, look at it. And then to kind of get winding down here, I just stumbled across this book. And, and it's uh, in the dam business, what I, I say is that water never sleeps. Um, you, you, with a dam, you just, it, it, water is always pushing. It's always, everything leaks, everything seeps. And, and kind of what we have done in, in the, for the past uh, dealing with floods is we've tried to speed everything up. We channelize it, we build levees to try to confine it and get it out of here as fast as we can. And what this, uh, this woman has said is that maybe we need to turn that on its head. We need to slow it down and let the river do what it's, what it's trying to do and let the land do what it's trying to do. In fact, there was an editorial, I found this because of an editorial in the New York Times that, that they're finding these old um, um, uh, aquifers that they think would be a, be a really good way to recharge them by these old rivers that have been uh, buried. And, and so this is one of the things, you know, because they're, they're over pumping their water, their groundwater out there. And, and just it kind of made me think about, you had um, uh, Douglas Hallamy, I don't know if I'm saying his name, that um, slow water was articulated by Aldo Leopold and his son, Le Luna Leopold. And I think it's connected to all the Leopold's land ethic, ethnic mentioned in Nature's Best Hope by uh, Douglas Hallamy. And I, that was last year, I believe. And I actually went in that course, I got to meet uh, Luna Leopold. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, so we can I know lights, but just before we turn on, tell me. So this is so this is rivers turning into art. Does anybody? Uh, what are we looking at there? To me, that's art. This is this, this is showing you. I think we're oh, this is the Mississippi River here. This is the Ohio River here. So here's Camelo. But it's interesting just how much I'm showing you how much the Mississippi River works the land. It moves, but then we have some sort of geological feature here that is very tough and it can erode, so it just kind of squirts here and almost comes out of here with a fire hose and then makes its way down. Mm -hmm. um, and this was done by, I think it was, yeah, 1944. And you can actually buy this online, I think, you know, on Etsy. They'll print it out to you and, you know, like artwork. I, I think it's just, uh, I just, uh, it was beautiful. I, I just think it's this uh, river doing art for us. So, Yes, question. I'm a canoeist, and uh, I'm in the Plains River. Every May, there's an 18 mile race. When we started, when I started doing that a quarter of a century ago, there were five dams on the Plains. There's been a lot of activity over the last few years by both Lake County and Cook County removing dams. Uh, the things I've heard is that the water quality is better, the animals, the fish, there's a lot of, the, you know, the, the river starts to go back to what its courses used to be. The impression I get is that removing dams helps with flooding. Would that be an overstatement, an understatement, or a wrong, or what, what's your feeling? You're a dam guy. I'm a dam guy, and and those dams, uh, I'll be blunt, did absolutely nothing with respect to reducing flooding. Right. I mean, Especially because the opposite makes it work. Um, they really don't do that. But those dams basically disappeared when you get into higher flows. They literally, it's called, they would get drowned it out. You, if, as the water comes up, the tail water comes up oh, yeah. and, and you don't see them. Right. So the water, the water, the empowerment of the dam is potentially an area that could take more flooding water. But you need, I guess, hopefully my point is here that you need such a large area or to store that water that they, they don't store any, it, it really, it doesn't do anything they, because they just don't store any additional water as if they weren't there. Uh, the best example was I've inspected it, I've inspected the dam for Lake of the Ozarks, the Bagnell Dam. And upstream of that dam is the Teddy Roosevelt Dam, and that can hold back 5 million acre feet. Um, and that's a lot. Of, I mean, that is it, the flood pool, I think, is 40 feet high, and it's just unbelievable. So if you see this, that's what you need to build for flood reduction. It's just reduction. We used to say flood proofing. Now we've kind of pulled that back. Well, we'll reduce it because we know we can't, you know, we get these rainstorms you know, of these ungodly amounts, you, you, you don't have a chance really. So we reduce the flooding potential up to a point. But those little, those low head dams are mostly for farmers to cross. 
Um, and they were recreational pools is what the, the original intent of those were. Yeah. And they, they really have no, they did not have any impact on, on flood flows. Well, the, the one at Hintz, uh, which was removed, also uh, allowed you to, to drive your model T as well. Right, right, yeah, to ford the river, yeah. That's why you would use your Model T because you would ford the river. <laughs> I'll be here all week. Kevin, could you repeat the question after okay. the audience? Thank you. Yes. What effect is a deep tunnel being built in all the reservoirs? I can down the quarry down off of I-80 and all that sort of stuff. What effect does that have on flooding? Um, that really the biggest, what did the effect of the deep tunnel have on flooding? Um, and you mentioned the Thornton Quarry as you drive, and to me, that's it's just a crazy that you, when I mean, you drive on I-80, it's on both sides of you there. Um, he should have been in my lecture yesterday because I did address that directly during it. Um, that, that actually was built more for water quality, I would say. And again, so now you get into flow durations and flow frequencies. Our sewers our storm sewers are usually like a 10 year or 50 year event and really no more than 24 hours. So they're very low, you know, frequent floods. And that's to capture so that, that all the bad stuff doesn't, um, with the rainwater doesn't go into our rivers. So that goes into the deep tunnel and then that's stored in those quarries or those reservoirs until it can be treated down in Stickney. And um, I don't know, the one really that might impact us, I think you can see it some parts in Arlington Heights, it's the O'Hare Reservoir is the one for us, but it really doesn't do a lot for like large floods. Um, it's mostly, I would say, for water control or trying to prevent the storm, your combined storm sewers from discharging into your creeks. Good question though, yeah. And that's, I would say, part of that reason is why we have the, the, the river wall, because we don't, because of the, the Chicago River in for a long time was just an open sewer. When you would have a rain event, you would just, it would smell bad. And because of the deep tunnel now, um, the water quality is greatly improved there. And now if it doesn't smell bad, it, it's kind of a nice resource to have. I, if you haven't been down there within the last couple of years, it, it is an amazing, it's a beautiful place now, the Chicago River Walk, for, from Wolf Point all the way out to the lake. Yes, sir. Um, is there any data out there? I mean, you mentioned about like subdivision tech ground and you know you put a lawn over it and it's perfectly impervious. Now you compare that to you know as part of our commission, we try to naturalize the stuff and put it through various management groups and all that. Is there any data out there that compares the absorption difference between Acre of lawn versus an acre of prairie. So, like he's asking, is there any data that shows the difference between an acre of prairie and an acre of residential? I, yeah, yes, I think you there are there's a couple of different places um, where you could compare those two. Um, just that there would be the one thing I think it would be like a curve number. You could look up at charts at, at how those are treated differently or what what values you would use. So there, there, there would be some places to find the, the differences there, yes. Yes, yes. I have a question, you know, the Edens Expressway was flooded quite, quite really bad. So the, the water was actually shooting up through the uh, sewer. How come that happens here and not on the Kennedy? Well, I guess, like I say, there was that event that was in the city Emma, when was that? Do you remember when that was? When we, well, I guess what you have to have is is for just like an aqua, well, uh, for a geyser, um, the Edens, you you have to, it must be depressed. And so there must be a place up above where the water is running in the sewer and the water is up to here and that manhole is down here. And so the water pressure is this high. So it literally can lift that manhole off. And so it's a function of, of the connectedness of those storm sewers uh, and where the water is and, and pushing up on there. Because there was example of that having, happening in the city. And I was just amazed because I don't think the city in that relatively short distance that you could get that much elevation, but, but it, it was happening. There was a couple of pictures of, of uh, geysers coming out of the middle of the street. 
So it, it's a function just like if you think of a spring. It's the same thing when you, if you're walking along and a spring is coming out of a hill. That means somewhere in that area, there's water inside the ground that's higher than where that water is coming out. So it's pushing that water out of there. It's just the same way with uh, that, that manhole cover there in the Edens. So I assume like the, the most of the Kennedy is elevated, but there the, like the, the Edens is kind of uh, going, on, going down and under. So if there's water up above there, like on Lawrence or something, that's, you know, Yes. Uh, can you say something about River Watch and those little critters and the velocity of channelization? It seems like if we're constantly channelizing these streams and have destroyed them and are just gunning water down them all the time, uh, how do how do these critters even stay alive? I mean, is that the gauge of well, how, how they how they stay? Well, that I think from that, um, how do yeah, I was just, yeah. Um, with, with the urbanization of canals, you would think just the water just gushing in there. How do those little critters stay in there? Um, that, I think that's uh, the critters that are able to stay in there is an inference then of the quality or the, of, of the stream. Because that, if it just shoots in there, it goes from feast and famine. So then it goes from all this water and they're maybe trying to find nooks and crannies and in lee packs leaf packs and any any rocks but also then the, on the flip side then is it, it usually goes down very slow so there's very little water and then the water quality goes very bad and so it's usually things like you get into these blood worms and stuff that is kind of kind of gets into the sand and then those those are kind of the ugly ones if it's really bad and the ones these these kind of funner ones that usually means it's a better water quality almost uh so they just like they they've adapted to survive and hang on, um, and just there's the substructure, and that kind of goes into this. Um, depending upon what the stream, that's what this is supposed to. You get into this, and what is the substrate? Is it rocky? Is it gravel? Is it sand? Is it clay? Depending upon that, it will have a different uh, macroinvertebrate uh, um, climate. Ecosystem. Yes. Is that your leadership involved telling communities when you think they may be overdeveloping their properties? Prospect Heights has a and Wheeling, our closest neighbor, Mount Prospect, an unchecked amount of development from multi dwelling to corporate housing to uh, Single family dwellings, the Gary Cherry Creek, and it hasn't ended. What we see now is a wall along our river because the Mount Prospect people were flooded so much. But nobody's looking at why are they being flooded so much and why is the river always staying high? Do you ever direct communities to say, you put enough building here, now it's time to balance it with natural growth in order to get some semblance? of predictability of water, air quality, and pollution, which we all exhibit now. Do you direct communities this way? Uh, I, the question is, do I direct communities on trying to control or regulate uh, development? Um, no, I inspect dams. I would say the uh, I inspect privately owned dams that make electricity. Um, but that usually um, is at the, the ordinance. Um, I think we've done a lot. We've improved a lot in that we require, um, at some level, it triggers that they have to start doing retention and detention. Uh, so we, we've made great strides, but I think it would be interesting, like I say, I just stumbled on this book um, just to, you know, like I say, in the past, it's been like, how, how do we get the water out of here faster? And, and I think we've seen that, that works to a point and then it doesn't work anymore, especially when we get into these urban, but, but I, then it's like, um, it's, it's, there are no easy answers anymore. Just when we have this many people and, and it's so urbanized and, and when you have an event and it's kind of flat like this, um, like I said, I was trying to point out when, it, when you get an inch of rain now in this kind of setting, it just is a lot of water and it's got to go somewhere. 
and and just where does it go is the problem like anything we can do like uh and to me i think just this community that that uh you know it's i don't think it's most of it is uh, ditches you don't have storm sewers here and so your runoff to me it would be interesting to model um you can make assumptions and model what the response would be in mcdonald creek if it was storm sewered as opposed to the way it is now. And I think you would be shocked about how it would be even steeper, even worse. Like I say, we've been in this mind that we, we got to get the water off the streets right away. And, and I, I kind of get a kick out of, I see people going around like we have a big storm and they'll pull the leaves off the uh, storm sewers so that, you know, it drives And I'm like, I, I don't mind the water in the streets because I prefer it to be on the streets as, a per, as opposed to in the sewers surcharging your manholes and coming up uh, your drains in your basement. So I think the streets are a very good place to store the water for a little while. And we, we maybe need to be inconvenienced for a little while. It's gonna take, it, it takes a mindset, you know, that we, we just can't be inconvenienced. Uh, and to me, just the same, I'm just thinking about snow, you know, that um, with snow, oh my God, you know, we gotta get the salt trucks out. We can't be inconvenienced. Uh, and, and just the salini then it's just, uh, I just, tough it's just not good for the soil but then we just can't slow down or, and, but it's not as bad these days with you know a lot more people working at home uh but it's it just it's going to take a different mindset it, it's a hard one yes kevin there's a comment on zoom and a question um i believe it's dana that says gerard wilhelm says that a mature prairie can absorb a hundred year rain event for 24 hours do you have any opinions on naturalizing um, I, I, I think it, that's very, I guess to me, you, you, there was many things that would have to be involved in that. You know, what is the slope? Is it sloped? Uh, what was the initial conditions? Where is the groundwater? Um, it's possible. Like I said, this river I was involved with, the Osabo River, um, it, it could handle, yes, an intense rain and it would just soak it up like a sponge. Uh, it would be interesting then if you're downstream of that, there's another thing I did not cover. It's called the flow duration, a flow duration curve. And you could then see how much it absorbs and then how slowly then it releases that water. So yeah, it, it's possible. And so another place would be similar to that, especially if you get a prairie like that in a, in a glaciated area where you get the drumlins, um, where it's poorly sorted, those areas can have um, even uh, huge infiltration rates on the order of 20, 30 inches. Uh, but again, it, it, if it fills up, then it can't absorb anymore. So there's, it's possible, yes. I would say uh, as a good answer, it depends. Good question though, Dan. Yeah, it would be interesting to measure if you could do that before and after. Any going once? <laughs> Kevin, I have a question on one of your slides. Um, when you were talking about the 100 year um, flood event in 1987, one of your slides said something happened in 1992. Um, and I wondered what that was, because that's when I moved into Prospect Heights. And I don't remember anything major happening, but. Oh. Well, in 1990, was that 92 or 95? 92. 92 was the, 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 the river, the leak. It's called the Chicago leak because that's when they, uh, they were driving piles or bumpers down by, I think it was the Kenzie Street Bridge and they punctured the freight tunnel. And then over time it filled the tunnel. And so they were noticing there was water in their basements um so yeah that was so that was yeah the chicago flood of 1992 april april 20th 1992 somewhere in there and what was interesting read about that because one of the then it becomes a very interesting legally is that maritime law or is that terrestrial law that that governs that so that was a huge court case of like whose rule govern and luckily for the contractor that was driving the piles, it was decided that maritime law applied and that greatly reduced it, reduced his liability. Because I think it was like $2 billion. Yeah, the Board of Trade was shut down for a while. It was, it was, it was devastating to the downtown area. Do any nuclear plants freak you out? I mean, they're all around the Great Lakes and there's uh, resilient 
prizes there? Um, no, no, that's that's the least of my worries. <laughs> um, and there, there's, I mean, you start, uh, I guess, in what way? I guess we, um, the state of Illinois gets, mm, is the number one state for getting its energy from nuclear uh, um, source. Um, but I look at what's going on in France and Germany, they were going to, in California, they, the Diablo, they were gonna take theirs off and go all renewable. Now they're like rethinking that because if you get into energy and it's, uh, and you read, it's very controversial with my commission um, of uh, reliability. Um, nukes are great for, for baseline. They just keep humming along. And and ebb and flow of of uh, I mean flooding. No, and I would say the uh, no. I mean they. If you see the numbers that they have to design to, um, that's the least the least of the worries I think with nukes. Yeah. Right. They're there. Well, well, now, right. So yeah, now you're dealing with uh, yeah, potential failure modes, I would call it. What happens if it fills that up and you breach your lake? What happens, you know, if uh, you were all dependent upon wind power and it stops blowing like it uh, happened in Texas? It, uh, grid reliability is going to be very interesting in the next 10 years. You heard it here first. <laughs> Thank you. Kevin, there's another question on Zoom. Uh, any comments on the atmospheres rivers out west that aren't fixing the drought conditions? The Any comment on the atmospheric rivers that aren't fixing or the drought condition? Is that what the question? Yes. Well, it, 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 it's going to take, um, what I read, like the Colorado River, it's going to take several years of above normal snow and atmospheric rivers to recover from the, some of those drought conditions out west. Um, um, tell them, yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems like a lot, but it's still early in the season. Like last year, it kind of started off the same way. And then um, February and March, it didn't snow or they, were, they didn't get any more atmospheric rivers. So it came on gangbusters and then it, uh, it dried up again. So it's it's a long ways to go before we're out of the woods yet um, in uh, the California and uh, Western North the Midwest. Don't don't uh, yeah don't move out there yet unless you have water rights. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>